In this video we're going to look at resistance to change. We're going to look at uh, some issues which can lead to resistance and we're going to look at where the resistance may arise. It could arise on the shop floor amongst uh, the operators on the shop floor, or the line management, it could be middle management, it can be in fact anywhere within the organization. Uh, whenever there is a proposal to change something invariably someone else is affected and that normally is the center of resistance. That person normally initiates the resistance and tries to marshal support and get the, the change postponed or, or cancelled. So there's a wide range of causes for resistance and these are seldom very simple and they also involve a range of issues. Uh, sometimes when a change is proposed there are knock-on events that need to be considered and it's not perhaps just one department within a business is affected, maybe several departments and uh, there there are ripple effects right throughout the organization. So whenever a change is proposed it has to be handled with care. Typical attitudes towards change, as we, we've tried it before and it failed so why should we do it again? And we are an innovative business, but, and it's the but is the problem, we're an innovative business, but we don't like this change. We, we're an innovative business, but we don't want to change what we're doing. Highly contradictory, but um, we often hear expressions like this. And we're our, the big one at the bottom. This is not the time for change. This is the time for consolidation. This is the time for reflection. We often hear this as well. We hear it amongst politicians, we hear it amongst business people, we hear it amongst all classes of people. So these are the, the, the fundamentals, if you like, of the resistance of change. They are somewhere deep within the psyche. We don't like change. We like to have routine. We like to be able to predict what we're going to do in the day. We don't want it to change. Um, so there are many issues associated with, with change. Now let's list the most frequent sources of resistance to change and unwillingness to engage in new behavior. Now this is just a, a straightforward list and at the end of this we'll finish our, our video. But um, let's have a look at some of the, the sources of resistance. The first one is fear of the unknown. Well, we don't like the unknown a lot of the time. Some people revel in it. They, they like the surprise, they like the excitement. But some people want to have today the same as yesterday and tomorrow the same as today. We don't want, we don't want any surprises. We don't want... So th there's a fear of the unknown and that may be the root of the resistance to change in some organizations. The fear of change itself. It could be a lack of information, the fact that people don't know what the change is going to involve. And if they don't know, if they're not well informed about it, they will resist it. They're, they're unsure about what's going to happen or what are the likely outcomes, so they will resist it. Lack of information could be a serious uh, contender for a big resistance to change. It could be misinformation. Perhaps in the past management has misinformed the workers and there's a credibility issue. They don't believe the management. So a change has been proposed within a certain department in the business, but in the past the management were, were wrong in what they said. Whether deliberately wrong or accidentally wrong, it doesn't matter. The fact was they were wrong in the past and people now carry this over and they believe there is misinformation. Sometimes also we believe that the government is giving us misinformation. It's not telling us the whole truth about certain situations. So there could be a resistance to change based on misinformation or the perception of misinformation. And as I said earlier it could be historical facts uh, or factors. Um, in the past the change was tried and it failed or something similar in the past was tried and it failed. Or this particular organization has tried to innovate in the past and it's always failed. It may be just that the organization is not capable of changing. The management don't have the skills to push it through. So there could be historical factors which are the basis for the resistance to change. Could be a threat to status. 
Some people may feel threatened by the change. They feel now, at the moment, they're operating as a manager within a, a small section. But if the change comes through, that position may now be threatened and they're going to be demoted, perhaps, or even made redundant. So there's, there's a threat to their status and, as a consequence, they resist the change. It could be a, th a threat to the, the power base. Sometimes different managers, uh, different directors in companies, senior management, some of them have got quite a lot of power. And they make, they're responsible for quite a big part of the business and making big decisions. And If this change goes through, they may feel threatened that their power base has been eroded. They, they feel that they're no longer respected in making powerful decisions. So they may resist the change. And it can actually work its way down to quite junior management. Somebody who's, who feels that they're running a small section in the, on the shop floor, let's say, making a certain component. Well, if this change goes through, they will no longer be wanted. Perhaps the, the change is to outsource the production of that particular commodity. Well, clearly, the people who are making it, their jobs are at stake and they're going to resist the change. So it's a threat to the power base. It's a threat to them. It's a threat to what they do. It could be that there's no perceived benefit. People are talking about change, but what are the benefits from change? And if they're not clearly understood, it's going to be resisted. Why have change for change's sake? There's no need for the change, then why have it? So they're looking at perceived change or perceived benefits from change. There must be some obvious benefit from the change for it to happen. If there is not, there's no point. There could be a threat to core skills. Uh, the organisation may have certain sets of core skills very skilled workers, for example, or the ability to make some particular com uh, component. Well, if the organisation brings out a, a certain change, perhaps that core skill will no longer be required. Uh, perhaps it will be outsourced to another country or to another producer. Well, that weakens the business and a lot of people within the business may see that and resist the change there may be a lot of disputes about the change. Low, low uh, trust in the uh, organisational climate. Uh, it could be that the, the management within the business are, are not really trusted so much. The, there's a fear that the management do not have the skills necessary to implement the change. They don't have a champion for the change. They don't have a proper rationale. They haven't worked it through. They haven't got the abilities to uh, lead the workforce and lead the change. And So there's a perception that the management don't have the right skill sets to perhaps instigate the change and, and manage the change. There could be uh, an organisational issue. It could be even the fact that the organisation itself is structured in a way which opposes the change. It could be the the whole departmental basis for the for the business would have to be switched around to accommodate the change, and the upheaval would be simply too much for the business to take. It would cost too much. So there's no trust in the organisational climate. Poor relationships. Simply, people don't talk to each other properly or they don't communicate properly. And it's difficult for one set of people to read another set of people's minds. There needs to be effective and clear communications. There needs to be questions and answers and clarity in the thinking. And it needs to be understood by everyone. There needs to be a consensus for change to take place, really. But if there's poor relationships between the workers and the management, between the management and different parts of the management, or between workers and workers even, if there are poor relationships existing within the organisation, that will hamper change. It will hamper the uh, delivery of change to that business. 
Of course, there's also the fear of failure. The person who came up with the idea of changing something in a business, uh, that person must be worried about the failure of his or her proposal. Uh, they're going to look bad if the proposal fails. If it's implemented and brings about bad results, damages the company, it's certainly going to look bad. And that person's career and job should be on the line, possibly on the line. But also their employability within the circuit and within that industry may be damaged. So there could be fear of failure. That could be an issue. The fear of looking stupid. Sometimes people propose things and or they want to propose something. They want to propose a change but they're afraid in case they, they look stupid. So they, they suppress it. They don't want to appear to be outlandish and extreme. They just want to uh, drift along. But they, they've got a good idea but they don't want to say it out loud because they're afraid of looking stupid. When they're questioned about it they're afraid they'll make mistakes or make a fool of themselves in public or so the resistance uh, to change is within the person. They, they are their own resistance. They have the idea for change, for innovation and so on. And it could be a really good idea, but within them they have the fear of looking stupid. So they don't want to engage in this. They, they, they suppress it. They just want to carry on as they're going. And the good idea never sees the light of day. There could be a reluctance to experiment, a reluctance to, to try out good ideas. Sometimes it may be possible to implement good ideas on a small scale to see how they work, to see uh, if they're worth running out through the whole organisation. So they might be piloted in one particular part on a small scale. But sometimes there's reluctance to even do that, reluctance to experiment. The company thinks, well, that's a waste of time. or. Uh, why do we need this? Why do we need to waste our time trying something else? So there could be reluctance to experiment on the part of management or uh, certain key workers. There's also reluctance to let go. Um, the idea that the, the company has, uh, has, has a long-term uh, pattern of production a long term pattern of relationships within the, the business and uh, they're all well established and they go back perhaps years and uh, the cultural climate of the business is settled and everyone knows what they're doing and they're friends and uh, so they don't want to let go they don't want to, to change it's, it's comfortable the way it is so why change so they may not want to to let go There may be strong um, peer group norms within peer groups, within management for example, at a certain level. Uh, there may be certain ways of working and they don't want to change those. They don't want to upset their colleagues and they don't want to make proposals that will alter the, the status quo. They don't want to upset the, the norms, the way things happen, what is acceptable at the moment it's working so why change it why 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 upset it at the moment the the people on the shop floor are working harmoniously they're they're doing their jobs they're it, it's running smoothly there are understandings between them they, they they know what they're doing what's expected of them so why upset it that could be uh in their minds it could be custom bound that the customs of the, the business require work in a certain way. If it's an old fashioned business making a traditional product, there may be reluctance to let go here again, but also it's custom. That's the way it's done. That's the, the history of the product. That's the history of production of this item. And they don't want to hand it over to automated processes and machines getting involved and computers and it's more traditional. They, they like the idea of doing it themselves. It's, it's their customs and the customs and the, the way the business is managed is, is a, it's an old-fashioned perhaps customary way. Perhaps the boss in the morning 
when he or she arrives goes out and talks to the the people working on the shop floor and the chat for a bit about the football the night before and it, it's an easy going environment they're not out to maximize profits or out to maximize anything for that matter they're there to survive but they're not working too hard and above all they're trying to maintain skills and perhaps skills from the past so it's all a very pleasant environment so they don't want to have change Plant in 1995 suggests that resistance can be divided into two forms and we're going to finish on these the first one is systematic systematic resistance and the second one is behavioral well systematic resistance is because of lack of appropriate knowledge information skills and managerial capacity so the systematic one is because of lack of appropriate knowledge information skills managerial capa uh, capacity so it, it's systematic it, it's it within the system the system uh, which includes people methods of working and so on they there is no knowledge of of why they should have changed they they don't want to engage in in further training or or knowledge or they don't feel it's worthwhile there might be a lack of information about the benefits of change or or the way it's done skills would have to be updated and change and management itself would have to have the capacity to drive through the the change and champion champion the change through the system the behavioural resistance describes resistance deriving from reactions and perceptions and assumptions of employees of the organisations. So the behavioural response or the behavioural resistance to change is more within the individual. It, it's, it's the emotional impact that the change would have on the individual. The way they would see the change or perceive the change, imagine the change. Whether their perceptions are right or wrong is, is almost irrelevant. The fact is, they will resist the change if they think it's not to their advantage or the advantage of the business and them, and they're not going to benefit from it. So, so why do it if they themselves do not benefit from it? And this should also look at the assumptions that the employees are making about themselves, that their salaries will not increase significantly, they'll be expected to have new skills, new training, and... Uh, it's all a problem for them so there might be behavioral resistance it's inside the individual it's it's resistance which is based on the psychology of the individual so we have systematic change that the the system itself through all its connections and the information flows and the skills and so on they could be inadequate which will limit resistance uh, so it will limit uh, the possibilities of change and it could be behavioral inside the individual him or herself so in this session what we've done is just looked at a whole set of points that could arise which will lead to resistance to change and it's a good set of points it's worth noting and it's worth having um, at your fingertips because these are the areas where resistance to change uh, can be uh, identified and sometimes when we're looking at real organizations and looking at uh, or case studies and we're looking at situations where there was resistance to change we can bring it back to one of the points we just mentioned in this session but that's it that's what I'm going to do in this session so I'm going to leave it at that and say thank you for watching <laughs>